Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the vacuum transport seminar. Um, it is our pleasure to kick kickstart the new edition, which is already the fourth edition. Uh, my name is Natalie Nick. I'm from Swiss Loop, and together with Eurotube, we started the seminar uh, almost two years ago. And now other our partners have joined um, after after a couple of semesters, and it is our Pleasure to, to welcome everybody today. So we're now um, executing the seminar together with uh, TUM Hyperloop and together with the University of Applied Science, Emden Lehr and University of Oldenburg. So I would quickly like to introduce um, the representative people today. So we have uh, Daniel Lehmann from Eurotube. Then we have Lukas Eschmann from uh, the University of Applied Science, Emden Lehr. And we have Dominic Rotek from uh, Tom Hyperloop. So yes, it is our pleasure to welcome, every, uh, to welcome you, the audience tonight. And first I would like to give a short overview of our seminar uh, content today. So we would like to introduce the seminar itself, uh, what it is about. And then as a second step, we already have the first, um, uh, first lecture or first um, presentation about the student from Tom Hyperloop. So um, yes, as I said, um, it will be quickly introduced. Um, and then afterwards we move on to the goal of, of the seminar and also how it is um, laid out together with slider.com and the dates when it will be carried out. Yes, then on the next slide. Um, yes, so I would like to start by introducing Swiss Loop to give you a short overview uh, what organizations are part of the seminar and how the seminar uh, was brought together. So as I said, I'm representing Swiss Loop uh, in this seminar session. Um, I joined Swiss Loop um, a bit more than three years ago. And so Swiss Loop is a student team, um, the Hyperloop team of ETH Zurich. We uh, conduct research on Hyperloop pods, Hyperloop prototypes, and take part in international competitions. So uh, the SpaceX competition, and now with the European Hyperloop Week. We are in close contact with the sponsors from the industry and work together with them, but the whole engineering is done in-house uh, with our students who are part of the team. And Yes, we also see ourselves engaged in the development um, or in the in the support of the Hyperloop research and yeah, to bring Hyperloop closer to people, which is why um, one of the reasons why the seminar is conducted. We are every year a team of around roughly 30 students and we're also um, a, a so-called focus project from the Department of Mechanical Engineering, which means that a couple of students taking part in the team also get credit points. For, um, for the work. Then on the next slide, we can see a short overview of Swiss Loop's history. So we started off in 2016 uh, with the development of the first pot for the Hyperloop competition. Um, yes, and here you can see a short overview of our history of the different pots we designed so far and the different teams. So currently um, around a month ago, the fifth team started, which you can see depicted um, on the bottom right. And yes, then on the next slide um, is a short technical overview how our pods look like, looked like. Um, we, just to give a short technical insight, we now um, focused ourselves on the development of the propulsion mechanism. So to give a short overview, we started off with a as a propulsion mechanism with a cold cost propulsion. Then a year later, it was a linear motor, uh, sorry, uh, electric motor. And from then on, we focused on the design of um, linear induction motors. And yes, of course, we're all eager to see what this year's team will develop after three linear induction motors in a row. Yes, then I would already like to hand over to Daniel from the Eurotube Foundation. And yeah, we're interested to see what he's telling us about the Eurotube Foundation. 
Thank you very much, Natalie, for the brief introduction. Also from my side, uh, I'm pretty pretty happy that I'm uh, able to represent Eurotube in the vacuum transport seminars uh, now for the fourth edition. Um, myself, um, I joined the um, Hyperloop um, um, Eurotube uh, some months ago. Um, since then, I've been learning a lot, uh, not only in the uh, pod side, as uh, Natalie has been also talking, but mainly on the building of the infrastructure, which is what uh, Eurotube is uh, mainly targeting for the couple of years. So uh, basically at, uh, at Eurotube, we consider ourselves a nonprofit organization uh, classified through the Swiss government as a research infrastructure of national um, uh, relevance, meaning uh, we, are, we are not only looking into re research and development of our own technologies for, for building the infrastructure, but also uh, looking into certification and regulations, uh, passing through also the incubation and tran knowledge transfer, which we are also jointly doing with ETH, Swiss Loop, and also Academia, uh, where uh, we are also um, in the cooperation in um, setting master thesis and even um, giving the opportunities to students to, to do their uh, internships. So if we go to the next slide, um, our vision, in, in for this vacuum transport technology, Hyperloop, as you know it, is really uh, building uh, an accessible open air test track, uh, vacuum test track to, to all the, the Hyperloop community, um, going through our, our milestones, as you can see them in the slide. So uh, we started 2017 um, as a, a spin off from ETH uh, together with EPFL, validating our first. Uh, two prototypes in 2017. And then now we're in the current state uh, where we are developing uh, a demonstrator track in Zurich uh, with, with 120 meter track, which will be then validate our technologies for our, our main goal, the so-called Alpha Tube, which is a three kilometer vacuum test track uh, set it in, in the south of Switzerland, which will be then allow, allowing us to really scale up the system to the so-called Beta Tube, where we are like uh, targeting test tracks uh, over 30 kilometers to join cities such as uh, Zurich and, and Bern, for example. So um, if we go to the next slide, uh, we have a brief overview of what the Alpha Tube test track uh, looks like. So here, um, as I uh, briefly told before, um, we're talking about a three kilometer test track uh, based in the south of uh, Switzerland in the um, canton of Ovalle, where um, it is intended to be the first um, vacuum test track where as, as, uh, not only acad not only in universities but also industry partners are are able to test their technologies related to vacuum transport uh, up to a speed of 900 kilometers an hour with a, a tube diameter of 2.4 meters which allows really um, a potential scale up of vehicles for the next iteration of the of the of the test track. If we have a, a look in the next uh, slide, uh, we can see the current status of current status of um, some of the technologies we are developing in house right now. So perhaps on the right side, uh, we are looking into uh, ways how to integrate the track side propulsion for the vehicles inside the tube, uh, passing also through the um, through the through the gates, as you can see it on the on the bottom of the image, where we are now in comparison, for instance, with uh, Fawate developing the first um, up to date um, uh, vacuum vacuum uh, valve, which will be then allowing us to 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 validate key key technologies for for Alpha Two. Um, maybe on the uh, to finalize on the red side on the right side, uh, we also have a, a, sh a short uh, mock up of our first um, concrete uh, pipe, which we have successfully proven under vacuum, which will be then implemented uh, for our demonstrator in, in Zurich. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. So, so I guess right that the the grid that you evolved will also be two point four meters in diameter finally. 
Uh, sorry? Your valve will also be 2.4 meters in diameter, right? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> okay. Perfect, nice. So yeah. let's come to us, uh, the University of Applied Sciences and Lea and the University of Oldenburg. Um, so we also started in the Hyperloop with the Hyperloop Pod competition in Los Angeles, and then uh, started funding the Institute of Hyperloop Technology, where we now have curricular implementation into the studies of engineering physics, where we look at various fields of the Hyperloop and the research we have here. So for example, we are looking not only in the studies of engineering physics, but also mechanical engineering design studies and various other touching on, for example, aerodynamics, the economic feasibility, and matter of many other research topics. Furthermore, we are also integrating that with research and development here at the university, and we are starting projects on national and European level, and we have plans for a large-scale European research infrastructure, but you'll probably come to that now. So the large-scale research infrastructure there's, there's one existing for Maglev that is in Laten in the Emsland in Germany. So that's where we propose to build a large scale European research infrastructure, which has a track length of right now 32 kilometers, which can be reused then as a Hyperloop research infrastructure. And it has a very large footprint, as you can see, and the available infrastructure there is, is perfect for testing and it has all the supplies needed to offer a perfect opportunity for research organizations, but also for the private sector for Hyperloop. Um, as you can see, the loop design in the bottom right corner there offer, offers perfect conditions for continuous high-speed testing, and not only uh, one way back and forth, for example, like we see in a lot of smaller test scale uh, operations right now that we see all over Europe. There's a stepwise approach and in building up this research infrastructure, as you could probably guess. So there's, there's first the, yeah, the, the proposal that we can start with a smaller research and smaller superstructure research. Then we go to a six kilometer linear infrastructure with a switch. And at the end, the, there's the 32 kilometer infinitive loop and operation research infrastructure. Um, and this offers multiple opportunities because as we are building on the existing infrastructure, there's a lot less costs, as you can see, uh, compared to, for example, what you would uh, need for a bigger research infrastructure um, and a completely new research infrastructure that would um, basically have uh, at least two times the costs for setting this all up. Finally, um, we also have, I don't know if my screen is still, still shared, I think so. We have a few more projects that we have here at the university. We have uh, the open network that we are setting up for all interested parties in this European Hyperloop uh, research infrastructure. And there's a pre-project financed by the Ministry of Lower Saxony. Additionally, we are also part of the Hyperloop development program, which is subsidized by the Dutch government, uh, where we'll look also look into large scale research infrastructures and there are needs for, for new large-scale research infrastructures. So what do we know from the existing research infrastructures and what do we need to apply to future research infrastructures? And finally, we're also part of the EPI Center Consortium, a European consortium, a European project, where synchromodal algorithms, for example, are applied to multimodal transport and logistics nets or networks. So why is Hyperloop a, a good um, addition there? Because we are getting this new technology into these algorithms and bring that into cooperators, simulators, so that everybody who wants to do transport basically can, can then see what kind of opportunities Hyperloop and vacuum transport offers. So then I'll just hand over to TU Munich. Yo, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dominic Radek. I'm currently technical lead of the TUM Hyperloop team. Um, I was part of some of the competitions as well. Uh, so what you can see here is the uh, small scale ring, we call it on the right side that was already built three years ago where we had such a small 30 centimeter pod um, magnetically flying in this concrete tube. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to give you a bit of an introduction into our team. Uh, if you quickly go to the next slide, um, we come from SpaceX competition, that for sure. Uh, we took part there all four times and were quite successful. Um, 
But I think what's more interesting for you now is what we're doing now. So I would ask you to <laughs> get one further. Exactly. Thank you so much. So um, what happened during the competitions already is that part of our focus was on developing a real Hyperloop system. On the one hand, we had the competition team that really focused on let's go as fast as possible. But on the other hand, we, of course, also thought on okay how could a hyperloop really look like and out of that actually uh, was done this the small scale ring um as i said already three years ago um and um with that we were also able to build a collaboration um of this next prototypes um non-commercial organization in german it's called verein of the TUM as university um, and the Bavarian state, especially um, that were very interested in the technology and in some, they call it high-tech agenda, we um, are a part of now and uh, got financed uh, a nice project um, in which um, currently nine PhD students work together with about 60 students on like, building the real Hyperloop thing. Um, and that's what we get to on the next slide, just quickly here. So what we're building right now is this one segment, we call it, of a tube, only 24 meters. So we won't go that fast there. But the idea is to really um, yeah, implement all the functionalities or basic functionalities you will need later. So um, levitation, propulsion, vacuum, life support system. And then in the next step, there would be uh, uh, one kilometer track planned um, and then uh, 10 kilometer reference track this is also is kind of a political thing um, as this was already mentioned uh, by Mr. Söder um, so but the goal is to like at some point really um, demonstrate the full speed of a Hyperloop system yeah and then if you go to the last slide exactly so this is what we're currently doing um, we have this large team developing uh, this full scale system. So, we really want to have a pot, like a real pot where somebody could really sit in and it actually works, um, not scaled down. Um, and uh, yeah, a real tube in concrete um, by beginning of 2023, um, fully functional. And yeah, in parallel, uh, there is also quite a big team working on. Um, all the other aspects, not the technology itself, which is simulations of um, uh, tracks, for example, or also of economic questions um, and, and also safety aspects um, to, to make sure that or the Hyperloop idea itself works in every aspect. Um, but as we all know, it's a huge thing and there are so many open topics. Um, so I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, I watched plenty of the seminars in the last semesters and was amazed on like how many really nice input there was. And uh, I am really looking forward for the lectures today. Uh, Benjamin will, will start from our side and we look forward for that. Um, and yeah, wish you a great time here in this seminar. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for giving an insight into all your organizations. It's really interesting. And I think this is one of the goals of the seminar to really bring together all our European organizations and institutions working on Hyperloop and yeah, to foster the exchange and yeah, just to offer a platform where these discussions can take place. So yeah, it was really nice to see the input from everyone. Exactly. And yeah, we would also like to um, to emphasize again that in like Swissloop and Eurotube offered the possibility to do thesis. So bachelor, master or semester projects like as a collaboration with us. And I'm sure there is also something at Tum Hyperloop and at the University of Applied Science and Lair. Maybe Lucas and Dominic, maybe you can quickly um, tell us about what is possible at your universities to do as a student project. Lucas. 
Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's touching all the topics uh, right now. And we are especially happy that we can include students in, yeah, in the work we are right now doing and all the EU projects and these, these real research projects that we have. So we can include the students there and uh, give them yeah, the, a look into what research is looking like after, for example, the study. And where can students find those projects? If they would like to do one, should, who should they reach out, reach out to? They're all on our website. You can you just reach out uh, to, to one of us, for example, to Professor Neuer, Professor Schöning, who are also here in this call. Uh, you can contact me or just go to our website, iht-mnton.de. Very nice. And in your case, Dominic? Um, yeah. Actually, that's just the right moment. We're currently recruiting. Again, uh, we have 25 open positions on the website, apply.tomhyperloop.de. Um, so yeah, basically there's uh, topics for everyone there. And yeah, we also offer thesis on all the topics at the moment, yeah. Very good, nice. So yes, as I said, the seminar offers a platform where students can present their work, but also where we invite experts to talk about their field or their companies. So it's basically a mix of both. It's around 50-50. And yes, so we're looking forward to all those inside talks. Then on the next slide, yes, just a short reminder. So it's from now on every Monday from 6 to 7 p.m. with the link, so the Zoom link stays the same. You can find the Zoom link on our website. It's vacuumtransport.org where you can also find the schedule and short abstracts about all the topics, so all the presentations. And then on the next slide, um, I would like to introduce you to the tool that we use for all the questions. So the tool is called slido.com. You can go to this website, either with your browser or with your cell phone. And then you have to enter a code. It's VAC Transport Seminar. It will always be the same code. And then you have the possibility to either um, as an anonymous, anonymous, anonymous person, or um, you can also enter your name, but you have the possibility to, um, to type in a question that you have. And after every presentation, we go through the questions and then the person who presented will answer the questions to the audience. Exactly, then here, as I already said, we have different projects on our website, swissloop.ch. And as you just heard, there are also possibilities for every other organization. Yes, so this was it from our site, from the four organizing institutions. And we would like to hand, um, head over to the first presentation now. And I would like to hand over to Dominic to introduce uh, the first student of uh, the Technical University of Munich. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, so we're all into technical stuff and trying to figure out um, what's the best way of levitating propulsion and so on. But in the end, what the people will actually see and feel and might cause people not to enter the Hyperloop is the interior um, and how it actually feels inside the pod. And uh, this is why Benjamin Steidel, um, one reason wrote, he wrote his master thesis, master's, master's thesis <laughs> about um, the seats uh, in the Hyperloop pod. And yeah, with that, I hand over to you and uh, have fun. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dominic, for introducing me. Um, I would just need the permission to uh, show my, my screens. Just got it. Uh, yeah, should. Now you should be able to see it. Yeah, we see it. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, as Dominic already said, um, it's not all always just the, the deep technical things and the levitation system. Um, what the, the customer sees in the end um, will be the interior and especially the seats. 
And therefore, the topic of my master thesis um, was the definition of a seed guideline for the public high speed transport system Hyperloop. Um, I did this for the last six months in cooperation with the um, chair of economics um, at uh, Tum in Munich. And um, yeah, I would just uh, start now um, how I started in my, in my master thesis. Um, so at first, I had a look at the competition. Um, so what are uh, the others doing? And it's not only the, uh, the Hyperloop competitors, but um, I started uh, with trains because this is the, I mean, the closest thing to the Hyperloop um, and uh, one of our uh, future main competitor. And um, I didn't have a look at the basic classes or the uh, S-Bahn or public transport. I started with um, more elaborate classes like the first class in uh, Deutsche Bahn Intercity uh, uh, Express, uh, the, the ECE, um, or for example, also international trains um, like the uh, Shinkansen. Um, this is also a very high speed train, it was one of the fastest trains in the last years. And um, that's the core class in Shinkansen. And that's the, uh, the highest class you can get there. Um, it's, you can see clearly that it's single seats. It doesn't have much in common with the normal trains, you know. And it's uh, from white to beige leather uh, with movable pillows, with uh, reading lights. You can adjust uh, perfectly on your book. Um, you cannot see it perfectly on this picture, but the seats have leg rests. You can adjust uh, electrically. And um, you can also see the control panel at your, at your armors there. And similar uh, luxury or similar seats are also uh, included in, in other train concepts. Uh, for example, the Class E Express um, that has a similar uh, high level class. Um, what you also can see, those seats have no base, as uh, all trains um, in Europe, um, they don't need to be equipped with, with seat base. Um, because the accelerations are way too too small um, to move the passenger considerably forward or to uh, induce a, a risk of uh, of injury during braking or accelerating. Um, so that's also a, a huge point I will talk about later. Um, the second competitor we had a look at um, were of course airplanes, and uh, here I speci specifically had a look at. Um, economy premium. Um, in this picture, you can see the economy premium of uh, Emirates. And um, yeah, it's a sim pretty similar picture to the, to the train we just saw. So it's uh, the seats are equipped with a leg rest. Um, the cushion is uh, stitched. Uh, so it's leather and uh, with a nice stitching. And uh, also leather pillows you can adjust uh, to your head. And also um, those ears. So the, the pillow is, has a flexible part in it, so you can adjust those ears to rest your head on. Um, the seats have a recline function. Um, in this case, it's also electric, but um, most of the time it's uh, still mechanic. And um, also the leg room is much improved to, to normal economy seats. And um, the seat belts are, as you know it from all airplanes, um, two point belts are just around your lap and not, uh, not, about, on, not on your shoulder. Another huge competitor from Hyperloop in the future could be uh, autonomous cars. So uh, we also had a look at the concepts from main uh, manufacturers uh, that they presented. So nearly every large uh, car manufacturer presented an autonomous car um, concept in the last years. In this case, we see a, a concept from Mercedes um, and what all those concepts have in common, um, they have much more space in the interior. That's also because most of all of those cars are electric and you don't have those limitations from, from classic cars. And but what you could also see were uh, round organic shapes and uh, a lot of wood in the interior, uh, natural materials, um, also uh, carpet that is not a, not a typical car carpet. Um, but all in all, it, it provokes a super um, feel, or it feels like home in, in, in those concepts. 
So uh, you should feel comfy. And um, this also underlines the, the biggest uh, advantage of those autonomous cars. So what a private car can offer and no other means of transport um, is that they drive from your door to the door you're going to. So you don't have to stop over and switch uh, in another transport system. So you enter the car, exit the car, and you're there with where you want to be. And this is the biggest advantage, but additionally, because of the restrictions that are not there anymore, so the driver doesn't have to drive anymore. So you can redesign the interior entirely. So you can build in swiveling front seats, for example. So um, the front passengers can turn around and uh, sit face to face with the rear passengers. They can talk with each other. They can watch movies together. They can uh, play board games. And this all adds to the, to the comfort you have right now um, that your car is driving from door to door. So autonomous cars is one of the biggest comp competitors we have to have a look at. Um, but also Hyperloop companies presented uh, already their concepts. And um, for example, the first one I brought uh, is from Hart Hyperloop. And um, that's, that's a rendering they presented uh, I think last year. And uh, so if you, if you compare this with the, with the trains and aircrafts you saw before, um, even if those were already the highest or higher classes, um, you have uh, enormous uh, space here. You have, can this see my screen? I hope just stop for a moment. And yes, I can. Yeah, you have enormous leg room, and um, I mean, the seats are so wide apart from each other. Um, but also the diameter of the pods. Um, so it's hard to guess based on this picture. But uh, so on the, the woman that is sitting there with the headphones, there's another a seat next to her. So the diameter of the pod itself must be at least three meters um, from the, just from the dimensions. So um, even the tube must be much bigger. So you can already see that those concepts are probably not the not a real picture of the of the real concept. And um, this is also underlined if you compare those seats with those, you know, um, there's a really thin cushion. So uh, the backrest is just a few centimeters thick, and there are no armrests um, where they, you could put your your elbow on. Um, there's no belts. So um, it really looks like more like a like a public urban train, and um, yeah, the only feature you have, you have added are those uh, coat hooks on the on the wings where you can head, uh, rest your head on. Another concept um, was from Virgin Hyperloop, so this was their second concept uh, for the U U.S. And uh, if you have a look at this, it looks entirely different than the one I showed you before. So you have seats in both directions, and so not only in one direction. And um, the backrest is stopped somewhere below your shoulders, so um, the head is not supported. Um, also, the cushion is extremely, extremely thin, so uh, I would guess it's maybe just two centimeters or something. And that's, all, again, something you know from public urban transport, like in, in the subway. and. Um, that is a real difference from uh, like long distance um, modes of friends, what we know today. Um, the older concept from Virgin Hyperloop um, is this one. This was made for the connection between um, Dubai and in this area. And here you can see again, it's an entirely different concept. Um, you don't have those um, ears on, on the headrest anymore where you could rest your head on. Um, the seats are more sculptural, it's not, not a structure as you know it. So um, again, you can see that's a, that's a design rendering. Um, the difference here is uh, you've got seat belts and um, also just lap belts as in the airplane. But um, again, the, the distance from the seats is maybe around two meters. So um, from an econo economical point of view, this is never a valid concept. So it looks cool in the rendering. Um, but not a real concept. And so that's quite the base of my work. So what can we learn from those concepts? So um, 
I try to make it visible, um, but the last few pictures I showed you, um, they're really a celebration for designers. So um, they could uh, do their, their wishes and their projections of the future. And that's nice, but uh, it doesn't resemble the, the, real, the real seed that could be built into a hyperloop in the future. And um, also the range from the seats that look like in a subway to those super luxury seats that uh, are surpassing uh, maybe even business seats in, in aircraft. And um, so what I propose for our team that um, we do a different approach and we start not with the design, but with the requirements and the needs. And um, so we have a look at our target group and what this target group uh, sees as comfortable. But what also fits to the travel times we will see in the Hyperloop and um, set a data-based approach for the, for the seats and not a design-based approach. And um, why is this so important? Um, as Dominic already said it before, um, if the passengers enter the, the pod and sit down and they sit on the seats and uh, the seats are their direct contact to the vehicle, they um, put a, or the, they include the belt there that holds them secured or connects them with the vehicle and um, also if we ignore uh, toilet times for example um, then it's like 95 percent of the time the passengers will spend in the seat and um, this is the main part that the passenger will take home and tell their friends and what really makes the experience. So it's not uh, the, the electronics or something. Um, so the seats are a really the main factor for the passenger experience. And also uh, one of the main uh, elements that can um, carry the company's message. So if you want uh, to show your, your message, the seats are a really common thing to do so. And um, in the scope of this work, I started uh, to define my requirements. Um, therefore, I did an extensive literature, literature review, how, what is comfort, how are comfortable seats built, and how it can we achieve comfort. And um, the second uh, large base uh, were expert interviews. So I talked with uh, experts from the design area that are designing seats and interiors for public transport, for example, for aircraft and trains. But I also talked with um, manufacturers of seats and designers, or not designers, but the, the mechanical design of seats, and um, also with companies um, in the railway and um, aircraft sector that are operating the machines. So, um, for example, with airlines and uh, railway companies. And now I'm shortly describing those requirement categories. Um, for example, uh, one of the biggest influence factors is the business model. So um, our business model will define who will be our travelers. Um, so uh, this will probably mainly be business travelers and commuters um, because those are the main focus group that need uh, long distances in a short time. Um, but also the funding is a, is a big topic um, because the funding will define uh, the ticket price in the end. So those were the uh, first results of our um, business case studies that are still going on. And um, always this evaluation between the luxury level we can offer um, and the price. So there needs to be a trade-off uh, because you cannot do both perfectly. So you have to decide in which direction you want to, you want to go. But also the route network, um, as we <laughs> talked about it before a couple of times, um, is the crucial factor that defines the, um, the travel time. And the travel time, of course, is uh, a really important factor on the properties of the seat, how the cushion needs to be uh, built and uh, the materials on top. Um, because the thesis was written on the ergonomics chair, but not only because of that, um, ergonomics were a large part uh, of my considerations. So um, what we first started with uh, were defining the population that will sit in this vehicle. And in this case, of course, I um, focused on Europe. And um, 
then just the guideline defines uh, which percentiles need to uh, need to be the base for the dimensions. For example, the height of the backrest uh, needs to be fitted to the highest person. Um, so we never fit it to 100% of the population because the range is way too large. So the basic uh, knowledge is that we do it from 5 to 95%. And um, so you include most of the population, um, but don't have this extremely high effort of including uh, also those 5% of the, of the tallest people. And also a, a large part of the uh, ergonomic uh, considerations are the postures the, the people want to uh, to do. So if they want to sit upright for working or if they prefer to be reclined more um, to relax, for example. Um, the next big factor was design. So um, it's not only how the seats look, um, but also what they are made of um, and which message they carry. So um, a, a huge factor for this are, are mega trends that are we, that we're seeing right now, but that we're also seeing in the future. For example, the rise in veganism um, is a is a huge influence. So um, we're not using any leather or um, animal parts in the seeds, um, but also the sustainability in general. Um, doesn't stop with not using leather, but um, with using um, recyclable materials. Maybe if it's possible, also recycled materials that already have been recycled. And um, of course, that all the seed components can be split up at the end of the life and uh, recycled separately. So we don't clue everything together. Another big part is the safety. So um, which forces will be uh, during acceleration and braking, which forces will be uh, during cornering, and what forces are tolerable for the passengers. So um, that's also ergonomic um, thinking. So how much do the passengers feel comfortable with, or when do they say, um, so I will survive this acceleration, but it's not comfortable and will not do this again. So it shouldn't be um, uh, a super supercar ride on a, on a racetrack. So the people still want to perform their, their duties. And um, of course, the, this accelerations also um, define the need for safety belts and the safety equipment, and especially also the loads the seats need to, um, need to withstand. And from a legal perspective, um, there are no binding regulations for the Hyperloop right now for the interior. So, um, for example, regarding the belts or um, inflammab inflammability requirements, and there are no hyperloop specific laws right now. Um, but was also what also was a large outcome of those expert interviews um, that we have, we should use comparable laws. So um, this was also its part of compared regulations for aircraft, um, trains, and um, for example the transfer feed, transfer feed. And um, try to um, discuss which one is uh, the most uh, relevant one for the Hyperloop. Because even if we say we don't have to abide as laws, um, say we build something that looks cool but doesn't fulfill any laws, it could be a negligent for us. And in case of an emergency, uh, there could also come some liability risk with it. And um, because, oh, that, that's why that's a really important factor for us. Also, uh, persons with reduced mobility are a huge factor for us. So um, the seat should definitely be built so they can uh, fulfill the needs of every person, uh, no matter if they're somehow uh, impaired with, with walking or uh, with their eyesight and um, should be built for everyone and not only a few seats uh, that fulfill those requirements like we know it from, from trains today. So all those requirements uh, were collected in, the, in a guideline. And this guideline is uh, split in three main parts. So the first part is entering the vehicle. So um, in this part of the guideline, all aspects are collected. Um, for example, um, for finding the seat, where the reservation could be displayed, where the seat number could be displayed, 
um, the width of the aisle, um, how how the dimension should be that you can walk there easily with your with your luggage, and also with the layout. The next large part uh, is stowing your personal belongings, um, especially luggage. Uh, which size of luggage should be uh, should be able or the passengers should be able to store it um, in their direct surroundings. So, for example, under the front seat, or um, for smaller items like a laptop bag, um, that could also be the place between the seat and the auto shelf. And uh, yeah, how the how the seat bay size needs to be um, to to enter comfortably. Um, where coach shots should be should be foreseen. And then, last but not least, the third part of this um, guideline is the sitting part itself. So, in this part, all the uh, characteristics of the seat are described. Um, how the materials, the cushion, the dimension should be, and um, also the dimensions and um, to the to the surrounding seats. And then I compared this uh, this guideline with um, classical modes of transport, for example, aircraft, railway, and car industry. And um, this will give us an uh, impression of uh, where the, the hyperloop strengths are, but also where the weaknesses are and where we can uh, improve them to, to have a competitive uh, uh, awareness and um, for example with cars uh, they offer the most comfortable luxury seats but uh, the durability is not um, not good for public mode of transport so if you're just using it by your own then it's okay um, and also the sustainability in cars um, is lacking so it's a lot of leather and um, a lot of gluing so the seats are really bad to recycle um, of course, they are also working on this topic. In aircraft, for example, the seats are super lightweight and stiff um, to withstand all those uh, forces on aircraft, but therefore they are extremely um, expensive. And um, especially for young and uprising companies, uh, maybe that's not feasible to, to build it the same way like in aircraft. In comparison with trains, um, so train seats are really comfortable and durable. But um, therefore, they're really, really heavy because it doesn't matter really in a train. And um, also, from a safety aspect, um, they're lacking behind uh, the other modes of transport. And yeah, this was the outcome of this uh, the thesis and the guideline. And um, yeah, that's it with, with my um, short introduction. I thank you for your, for your patience. And um, now we still got some minutes for questions. Otherwise, you can also always contact me on the, uh, the email address on this page. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benjamin. It was very interesting. Um, I think you can leave your screen shared. Uh, for that, we have still the picture here. And yeah. then I would like to uh, hand over right to slido.com and moderate the questions from the audience. So somebody is wondering, um, did you design with mechanical engineering in mind and what is your background? Um, yeah, so my master was in mechanical engineering. So uh, maybe that's the main reason why it's not from the design aspect. And um, so in the scope of the thesis, I didn't design the, the final seats, but um, I did the ergonomic and mechanical baseline and collected this in, in the scope of a uh, of this guideline and now this builds the, the base for our future developments and so uh, we really have a scientific base um, for all future hyperloop vehicles and that we can rely on and that's not purely based on this uh, on this design that's just a visual design all right then the next question from the audience is what do you think why does the commercial hyperloop companies always show on functional and on economical interior designs? Um, I think that uh, they want to get attention and um, because that's what we also need right now. Um, so I also learned this during the interviews, a lot of people really never heard of the Hyperloop and the Hyperloop concept in general. And a concept like this, uh, probably also made from a known design company, 
um, raises awareness and uh, the media like reposts the pictures. And um, at this point, I think uh, the awareness for, for the Hyperloop is important. And that's why I guess they uh, decided to post those um, unrealistic, but uh, really nice pictures rather than a real concept or a, a feasible concept. This would be my estimation. Okay, yes, that, that sounds good, that makes sense. Um, then the next question is, what will be the differences to non-ergonomic chairs? Uh, well, non-ergonomic chairs, uh, it's, a white, uh, it's a white name. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's also a huge part. If, uh, if a person says a chair is comfortable or not, um, it, it's influenced by really many factors. So um, it's really also the look and uh, the, the materials and how it feels. Um, but there are certain points that need to be fulfilled so that the chair is not uncomfortable. And that's mainly ergonomic considerations. So um, if the chair is not, not long enough and um, you got pressure points on your, on, your, on your hips, then the seat can look as nice as, it, as, as, nice as you can imagine, but it will still be uh, uncomfortable. And so the ergonomic um, perspective is mainly on reducing those uh, discomfort points. And uh, then you can improve discomfort with, uh, with nice materials, with softer, with softer cushion, for example. But it's mainly on eliminating negative factors. And that's the ergonomic considerations behind it. All right. All right. And then we're already at the last question. And the question is, uh, what do you propose for exit? Like, what kind of accelerations do you propose? Um, this is also a topic in JTC20 for standardization. There could be, for instance, the possibility of sitting only backwards. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's really an important point. And I also discussed this with many economic uh, uh, professors. And um, also the accelerations are really a subjective feeling. So um, for defining the seat's stiffness, I took um, the accelerations between a sports car and a normal car. Um, so on the one hand, the, the passenger should be able to work on the laptop, for example, or read a book. And you cannot do this while riding on a sports car. But on the other hand, it's only for the first few seconds or minutes uh, during acceleration. And um, also, what would be an option would be um, entirely new concepts, um, depending on if there's an option for the hyperloop to turn, or if it rather uh, just drives back in the other direction uh, when it's at this final destination. So an option, for example, could be um, swiveling seats. Um, so all of the seats turn around during acceleration and uh, turn around during deceleration. So the um, the forces on the passengers always push them into the seat. And uh, like this, you could, um, or you don't need uh, seat belts maybe, but um, that's really a topic uh, that needs to be discussed further and will be, uh, will be a topic of further research, especially when we have the first demonstrators and can test something like this in real life and which accelerations are accepted and which accelerations are seen as uncomfortable. It's hard to tell at this point. All right. Yes. So thank you very much for uh, answering the questions. And also thank you very much for your interesting presentation and your insight of your work. That's really, was really nice to, to dive into your topic. So yes, so we're right on time. It's 7 p.m. now. Um, in the name of all the organizations, I would like to thank you, Benjamin, but also thank the audience and uh, yeah, thank the other organizations for, uh, for your inputs tonight. And yes, we're all looking forward to the next seminar sessions. So the next one is in a week on next Monday at 6 p.m. And we're looking forward to hopefully welcome all of you again. And yes, we're looking forward to interesting talks and discussions. So until then, we wish you a nice week. Have a nice evening and then see you next week. And yes, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. See you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.